Hello, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, I almost didn't make it. I was born, by the way, with a Saturn Pluto conjunction, the one that was in 1947, and uh, well, actually, Mars, Saturn, and Pluto. And so, um, it's it, it's been interesting because I I know that there's so many really excellent astrologers have written a lot on on the timing and the eclipses and the you know the nodal conjunctions and all the text talk and um, I was reading a very good article and um, by a fellow and I can't remember his name right now but I will and I thought okay this kind of covers it all and what I want to do today because this is what's happening is that every single one of us is experiencing a cyclic pattern and the last time that's most recent in our history where we had the Saturn Pluto aspects um, was back in uh, it was back in 1931 Saturn and Pluto were in opposition to each other and then they became conjoined in 1947. And so what we saw in the build-up, um, and it was also when Uranus had entered Taurus as well, um, March 7, 2019, and the last time it was in Taurus was June of, of um, 1934. So what we're looking at in the planetary zone is uh, a kind of repeat only evolutionary experience uh, because just because I have a Saturn Pluto conjunction that's in Leo, it's not on the nodes, but this particular Saturn Pluto conjunction that we're having right now, uh, January 20th, 2020, nice numbers, um, is, is very different because the nodes of Pluto take about a thousand years to evolve, to go through the entire zodiac. And so what we end up with is a very memorable period of time in the 60s, and I've shown this photo before, where we had an incredible uprising. Um, and, you know, you know, Saturn itself um, you know, was opposite to Uranus and Pluto during this time. Uh, when I was like in my late teens and early twenties, when we had um, an incredible so attempt at a collective global consciousness transformation. This is not always going to work, just because you you know, sort of revolutionary people who have the very best of intentions are making gestures like this curl with the flower, offering it to the guys with the guns, and they're going, what do we do with this? You know, like, what do we do? And so nobody's really engaging in a dialectic. And this was 1967. And so we're looking at like 70, you know, I mean, uh, 50 years ago. And so when Saturn and Pluto are together, um, we can we can look back to the most previous ones, like like I you know had a, a little list here um, of October uh, the fifth of nineteen fourteen. Let me just move ahead, get off this. This is this is an ephemeris. I, I, I printed this off of out of Amsterdam, so it's a little wonky. But it it, it starts February twelfth. It should be January twentieth because that's when the first real actual conjunction took place. But it shows you how long these aspects do last. I mean, they last for months and months. It's not, this is not, you know, like a Mars transit where, you know, you're being careless and you cut your finger. This is a, uh, a universal change. I'm not even gonna say global because it, it has more to do with the entire universe as it does with each of us. And as I said, I have was born with a Saturn-Pluto conjunction with Mars. And um, 
I think that's why I've been so anxious, uh, along with most everybody I've actually spoken to, who are friends or not, um, about what's going on, you know, because we don't know what it is. Carl Jung, you know, when he was writing and, you know, pondering the onset of, in the 30s, 1931, when there was the Saturn Pluto opposition on the notes, um, he was, you know, writing to people saying, don't introject the collective unconscious because it can make you ill. And so I think today that's what I wanted to really talk about more than the technicalities um, of the Saturn-Pluto conjunction, because a lot of people, this is the, the, a lot of people actually will have something to say, and I really want to hear that and and make this this talk because usually I lecture, I talk, and I pictures and so on, but I'd really like to share with others so that other people who are going to be listening and watching this, um, aside from you who are here present, um, I, I think you're going to find a great deal of, of, of consolation in we're not alone, yeah? And, and you know, we can say all sorts of horrible things about whatever country we're living in, but the fact is, is that those of us who are doing things like astrology, attending talks like this, we're really making a difference, yeah? And this all kind of began during Saturn opposite Mars, Saturn, and Pluto uh, during the, the 1960s. This happens, and, and then what comes later was um, in 2010 was that big square that we were all talking about then, yeah, between Mars and Pluto and Uranus. And so you see, nothing comes out of, the, out of nowhere. Nihil non nihilo. Nothing out of nothing in Latin, just to be uh, boring. Um, but you'll see that back in 2010, and here we are now at 2019, um, and coming into 2020, so it's 10 years later, we are actually now at this place because this picture I created for a seminar in that time frame, in that time, in, in 2020. And so and now I get to live to see the results of it. And so what's happened is that the transit of Saturn has moved along to make a conjunction to Pluto, but in a much later degree because Pluto moves slowly. Now, the other thing that's technical that I need to remind you is that um, I have read somewhere where somebody said that, there, that Pluto Saturn cycles are every 30 years. Um, actually, that's not the case. And the reason is because um, Pluto's orbit to the ecliptic is at a hugely 17 degrees um, slant to the level part. Of that. Venus is 7 degrees, Pluto is 17 degrees to the ecliptic. As a result, that's why now those of you doing charts and watching your own chart, you'll start noticing that Pluto is taking longer and longer uh, to move forward. It, it has gone from the typical, the three outer planets had for about 30 years exact three times passing the same degree, retrograde direct, retrograde direct. Now Pluto is actually making five passes over the same degree. And as it elongates, and this is where you can be cheerful, um, that if you were born, or if you were born and uh, when Pluto was transiting Taurus, it would last 30 years of Pluto transit. And so it makes me think, hmm, you should, should look back at the last time Pluto was in Taurus. Because when it was in Scorpio, for example, it was only, um, well, only, uh, it was like a, you know, a typical uh, three-year transit over the same degree exact. And so now we're getting this elongation, which, uh, and, you know, because Saturn goes around very regularly every 25, 29.5 years. But what's happening now is really quite unusual um, in that, it's not going to, really, it's not going to happen again for a very long time. 
Um, October 5th, 1914, um, Pluto and Saturn were conjunct at two cancer. Now we all know what was going on in 1914. It was the beginning of the World War One. August 11th of 1947, it was at 13 Leo a Saturn Pluto conjunction. And then again in November of 1982, it was at 27 Libra. And, and so the Saturn Pluto conjunction occurring in 2020 is unusual because, as I said, it's about a thousand years for Pluto's nodes to return. And this is a lovely picture. Uh, it's Goya of, of Kronos. Kronos, not Saturn. Saturn became evolved. Kronos devouring his children. And then these, these great sort of plane of, of fire and flame and oblivion. And a picture of Kronos leading. You know, we actually was the, the youngest and the first uh, leader of the Titans. And they were divine. I mean, he was actually born of heaven and earth. And he overthrew his father. And in doing so, um, she, he you know, put himself in a very dangerous position because the children declared war against him. And so Saturn has a very, um, a very negative kind of repu reputation in the sense that, you know, we often think of it as being you know, part of depression. Yes, um, because it means to press down, depression. Uh, you know, talked about that a lot because he suffered from rhythmic uh, and recurring depression, um, out of which sprout, sprouted incredible inspiration. Pluto wasn't cited until 1931. Okay, and so in that time frame, um, you know, um, there was a tremendous amount of social and global change. And I'm just used showing that, and I'm, and I'm showing you the discovery chart of Pluto because You'll notice that Saturn is at 8 Capricorn. It's, you know, within orb, within a few months, opposing Pluto and squaring Uranus. So what we're looking at is a, an ongoing repeat of cycles, which, of course, what you're best advised to do is to read um, my friend Rick Tarnas' book that... Uh, that's on cosmos and psyche and that has a lot i mean he has his researchers have you know looked up and found all the various formations of and and cycles going back uh, a few thousand years so we, we really get a good picture in that book even if we just look at the uh at, um you know the diagrams of, of and the dates but you see this is why pluto is so weird in the sense that when it's making a conjunction or in an opposition, let's say, to Saturn, um, it's, it's not in orb as the other plants are. It's called, it's, it, it, it's, it's because it has an odd orbit, which is why they've been trying to throw Pluto out as a planet for forever. But it does move inside the orbit of, of Neptune, and there's a period of sort of calm. But by and large, you know, uh, this would be, for instance, where it was uh, a standard sort of uh, 12 years in Scorpio, and then this would be where it's a 32-year period in, in uh, Taurus. So we end up with a really very irregular battle uh, going on between... Um, the sighting of Pluto and what's going on right now with the Saturn conjunction to it. Now, in my mind, um, being fairly Saturnian, I find that Pluto or Saturn is, it, yes, it's about lessons. Yes, it's, it, it, it's about um, learning how to, you know, grow your authenticity within your uh, boundaries, okay, so that you're not overspilling them. In other words, it, it, rather than becoming autocratic, you become auto-responsible so that yourself is 
at this stage with Saturn conjunct Pluto, really looking at all the wealth and value that you have in your heart and system and mind to really restructure the way you've been experiencing the world around you. Because the world around us is actually becoming increasingly more alarming. But then that's not new. I mean, it, it has periods where people go mad. And there are uh, extremely dangerous situations that arise. Most of us don't have that happen, which is really good, I'm happy to say. But what most of us do have is periods of terror, fear, anxiety. Uh, who am I? What am I doing? What am I supposed to do now? And so what we're looking at is we have to look at our depth of resources, Pluto, and what we really, really do have buried within ourselves and in our psyche. And also we need to look at Saturn. How can we control which is a good word for this case, control our anxiety and fear. And my way of thinking is talk to somebody. Reach out. Don't hide. Um, isolation is the worst thing that can be done under this transit. And it's the first thing that most people uh, actually fall toward in this, in, in this time frame is that they fall towards self-protection, defense, mechanisms that will uh, alienate us from another or others, uh, that we are feeling alienated because of other people's behavior. We have to, to really be very, very conscious that you know there are always going to be demonic, daimonic forces. Now, daimon, D-A-E-M-O-N, actually means spirit. Okay, and, and, but it's, it's, it's used as a, sort of a, in, in a demonic way. In other words, the spirit of the dark. Okay? And, and when we look at this picture, I, I mean, it's a really creepy picture. Um, it's real scary and I think worth looking at. But look at this strange creature that's flying in. And then there's the owl like, seeing in the dark and then the, the white horse lapping and then the, the, the fates, the three fates all sitting. And there's all sorts of little creatures hiding in here. So, but, but Hades wasn't a bad guy. Um, he, Pluto, uh, you know, Hades, drew this short straw when he and his brothers were dividing up the, their domains of, of rulership. And their domain of rulership, you know, between heaven, earth, and the seas, uh, you know, they, they drew straws. And so Zeus got the heavens, and Poseidon got the seas, and... Hades got the end of the world. And so Hades is in fact, if we look at it, is the guardian of the soul as it's in between lives, in between embodiment, in between incarnation. And I've, I've even written here one of the most powerful ways of using Pluto is to not vic fall victim to what Jung called the global psychosis, to remain a philosopher a lover of wisdom, truth, beauty, knowledge. You know, those of you who are here listening, those of you who will be listening at some other time, we're all these lovers of wisdom. And so we really have to pay attention to the part of us that has extraordinary strength, that can live through anything. Because what we're going to be seeing is not for any of us who are here in this room, and I would you know, say this when I was at a conference, I mean, we're fortunate, look at us, we're sitting here talking or listening or you know, exchanging with people who think uh, with thoughts, which doesn't mean that you don't get in a bad mood and think, you know, like I just wanna go, you know, knock that guy's mailbox over or something. Yeah, you're allowed to have those feelings, but you should not to kill people, you know, to, to, to you know, hold them up at the border so the children die and things like that. There's just a lot about Pluto because, I mean, the interesting thing about Pluto is he had a vision in 400 BC, Democritus, 
um, that it was possible to see that which is not seeable. He was the guy, Democritus, opened the door to seeing the unseen. And here we are at this point, seeing the unseen. There's me and all the cool stuff's over there. Yep. That's what it feels like. Oh, now what I want to do, seeing as I can, I can leave that there, is I wanted to ask you if some of you would like to share some of your feelings and experiences with um, knowing that the Saturn-Pluto conjunction is coming, with all of the attention being focused on it, and what has, and if you have like a Saturn, if Saturn and Pluto are, are conjoining, a planet or an angle, the last two clients that I've done, because um, I did a special on Saturn Pluto conjunction chart reading, and uh, it was lovely, several people responded, and, um, and then my uh, very long-term old client, extremely, extremely good person, with Saturn Pluto coming to his midheaven, which we've been talking about for a couple of years, so that now it's here, what do we do? Um, so it would be great if we could open up for some uh, questions because you know, all the data is available, you'll be able to find it, you know, all the historical, but I'd like to know what's going on now with us. So if we could open the, the uh, sort of door, if you will, to the uh, experience of Saturn and Pluto in specific, if you have it conjunct or involved with another planet. Can you share with us? Okay, if anyone has a question, if anyone here would like to share, um, let us know. I do have um, volunteer charts, which I can put up on the screen if you need them. Oh, okay, how do I get, I'm sorry, um, very, uh, every, every, oh. is always different every time. How do I um, go to the others, to you guys? Um, you mean you want to go back to, you, you want to uh, stop the share of the slides? I think so. I think that, that everybody got it, right? Okay. Anybody? Do you have the last slide, though, of, of your details? There we go. Anybody who wants to take. My recommendation for the uh, training courses is course number two because it's the archetypal psychological astrology that I've introduced and created. And it was a, a wonderful class, wonderful class. And uh, so be, feel free to go to my website. I've got tons of articles. I have one on Neptune that's particularly relevant for NERT right now because it's about being in lim liminality, which was Jim Lewis's, my astrocartography friend, good friend. Um, used to talk about liminality because it means you're, you're, you're not where you used to be, but you're not where you're going to be. You are somewhere in between, like Odysseus in the middle of leaving Troy and getting to uh, back home. Uh, it should have taken him a couple of weeks to sail it, and it took 10 years. And so these sea journeys that we go on in our psychological state uh, are really important. And so I thought it'd be really interesting if we could hear stories from other people. Yes, it would be good. Just um, let's just give us a few moments to uh, let's just wait for someone to come. How do I open the window to see people? Um, you would have to stop the share. So it's at the top. Of, that's it. So there you go. Here we are. See, so, I, I'm, I'm well behaved. I respond well. I just need direction. I do well, have some of the charts of the people here, a few of them, if any of them want to um, interact with you. So let's see who comes forward. Oh, so, I, can, I can say something. Yeah, please. Fantastic. Oh, you're always there for me. I love it. <laughs> Hi, Erin. Um, so the last... Uh, Saturn Pluto conjunction did not affect any of my planets. However, it was very close to my part of fortune. It was in Libra? When it was in Libra, exactly. Yeah. 
Right. That, that the exact day of that conjunction, I hurt my back. Oh. And it was a so. type of thing that has affected me ever since then. I mean, it's, it, cha it totally changed my life. It changed, you know, how, I, because I had to heal myself and, you know, and I had to get back on the, on my path. Yep. And a lot of, you know, a lot of things. So the one coming net, uh, yes. in January is um, just on my descendant, uh -huh. and, and it is uh, quincunx to my Venus, um, almost exactly. And um, it feels like I'm kind of um, going... I, it's kind of like a culmination of the healing process that I started in, in 1982 is coming to where I can now maybe even share my natal charts. Good enough. Natal chart. Good. Ah, yes. There you go. Saturn Pluto coming up to your descendant. And it's, um, yeah, Queen Kunks to Venus. And trine Saturn. I was going to say trine to Saturn. Um, Right. Well, several things. The way you allow other people into your life is going to change tremendously. And that's because the seventh house is up the reflection of the self, first house. And so the seventh house is about um, people who could speak on your behalf. They're your advocate, okay? Like a lawyer, for example, a friend who is intimate enough that could speak for you. Let's say you couldn't speak and they could speak for you. Um, your lover, a partner, a very good friend, you know, somebody who is really close to you or, uh, or people who fall into the zone of the other. And your own experience of that is going to change. Other people aren't going to change it for you. Yeah. So I wouldn't expect there to be any like global disasters around relationships, but I would expect that you would want much more depth than you might be, uh, that you may not have been able to cope with at a younger age, that you'll be experiencing the opportunity to make a big adjustment between your pride of Venus and Leo conjunct Pluto and work that into the, the trying to Saturn in the third of being able to communicate better uh, what your needs are and thereby not being so trapped. I think that this is a breakthrough transit for you. Uh, and of course it lasts for a couple of years, but it's also, um, um, you know, with Mars in Scorpio, uh, right on my sun ascendant, I would think that your need for, um, you know, much closer relationships as opposed to, say, social interaction is, is also going to deepen because it will affect your, your Scorpio house. It's a Saturn-Pluto conjunction. Have you noticed that? That is, that is pretty right on. I, um, I do... I also I kind of feel like I'm wasting my time if a relationship is superficial. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I agree. I mean, well, actually, you know, a good superficial relationship with a bookseller or, you know, the uh, you go into the bank or it's you, the PS guy, that's great. But that's not a relationship. Is it? Exactly. Yeah. And, and I can do that. I, I can do that. I can do the superficial, I, you know. Gemini Moon, Libra, Libra, I can I can do that. But that isn't what I that isn't what I prefer. And 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 so your your needs are are now being reformed, and and you're much more willing to to own them. Yes, that that's very true. I I well, spent a lot of time not knowing what they were. That's, that's really painful. I mean, what you've been through and are are going through. You know, I mean, even though Saturn is in your, by transit, it's in your sixth house because it's at 22. But it was going, it's been over your, it's still affecting. I mean, you're still resonating from, you know, what the experience was when Saturn went over your descendant. And then Pluto much, much earlier. But 
yeah, I think that the, the, the uh, you know, this, the quincunx of Venus is definitely about changing your self-worth. What are you worth? Are you worth wasting a bunch of time on somebody that because you're feeling obligated or guilty? Uh, you know, is it because, you know, whatever, yeah? So th these are the things that really cross your mind. Yes. Thank you. Uh, awesome. That very true. Oh, thanks for sharing, Sue. That's wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, we have someone else who'd like to share, Erin. We have uh, Carolyn. I'll just go oh. to the chart. Hi, Carolyn. So Hi, Erin. You're wearing a lampshade for a hat. Is this a party or what? I am, and I've got a cat on my shoulder. <laughs> I know. Where's your Where's your bill? Your bottle? Your drink? Yeah, you're supposed to drink. <laughs> It's good to see you, Carolyn. Laughing is good. Okay. I, oh God. I, I mean, if you'd have seen me before this, you would never know. I believe it. There you are. Okay. So, what have we got? Uh, we got Capricorn. Um, what? Question: Saturn and Pluto are going into. Oh, they're at your midheaven. Sorry, duh. They're going right over your midheaven. So this has a tremendous amount to do with reclaiming, if you ever gave it away, your capacity. Yeah, to really, you know, enjoy and take take charge of situations with other people, and to feel your own power. Um, the client that I had yesterday is a very long-term, like 12, 15-year client, 15 years. And, and he's grown in, a, in his law firm tremendously. He has had Saturn and Pluto going. We were waiting for Saturn and Pluto to come to his ascent, which it has done now. And what it is, is that you're coming into a time period where you really have to accept and own your power in your vocation which isn't just about like studies and learning vocation is 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 a calling vocare to call in the latin you're being called forward to consolidate your you know uh anxiety and fear of like, exposure and people seeing through you i mean as if you they are and they're not um, but you think they are, but that's going away because you know suddenly you're just going to stop caring about yeah about what the hell other people think of you. I mean, it doesn't mean that you're going to start being rude. But it means that you know it won't it, nothing it won't bother you. You will feel that you have been stripping away, stripping away this desire to be you know you know ideal and you know perfect and you know everything that you might not be and now it's it's not it's not a complex anymore it's like a, a, a complex breaking transit and yeah. that it is in fact making a pretty close set style to your natal mars and your chiron in the seventh moon so my interview here is 100 degrees here so you have you have saturn and pluto in the midheaven Sextile Mars, ish, and it's at Chiron. So all the wounding that you experienced in your one-to-one -one relationships in the very early stages of your life probably will come up to re replay them for you. This is not a, it, it's, there's a, a lot of tears that go along with this transit. A lot of, of emptying the self of the salt of, you know, the salt of healing, that's what tears are, is that, you know, as we, as we let our tears go, the salt is like healing. I mean, salt cures meat, salt is, you know, the ocean, it's our body. And so for you to, you know, privately um, experience your grief and loss um, and to put it in its place, I think it's going to be the biggest outcome for you after this Saturn Pluto is finished. But you have to allow yourself to just let go. Because nobody's watching. Yeah. Nobody sees it, your grief. 
And there may be even a few people you can share it with, you know, understand. And that's what really matters with Saturday of the Midheaven is people who really will give you a sense of being an important, a valid person. I, I, I have a shrink who looks like a 12 year old Yoda and I don't even have to drive into town. I sit where I'm sitting and we talk. Oh, okay. And, I, and no, not even just, I mean, I did go to him. Um, I lost my mind when Pluto really first hit my um, mid he he mid heaven in 2015. Uh huh. And um, I ended up, I left my teaching career overnight. I just, I didn't know I was going to do it. Right. All of a sudden, well, they were talking strike, and I'd been through a strike in 83. In 83, there was the strike. The love of my life left. Um, wow. I, yeah, I started towards find it towards leaving teaching that time because of a strike. It's true. And this time again in 2015, I left it. Anyway, all to say, I just feel like, especially in the last few days, I yeah. have joy that I haven't experienced since I was in a classroom with kids. Joy? Joy. Oh, sitting in fabulous. So that the... the the, the grief is now becoming good. And you do have a Venus trine to Jupiter. And the midpoint in there um, is, uh, is, is, is um, Libra, and it's Neptune. So, I mean, you, you have it's a, a wide, wide midpoint. But Neptune sits between Venus and Jupiter. And so your optimism level is really high. I mean, it's very hard to put you in a place of, desolation and, you know, an utter, you know, feel of there's no future, there's no hope, except for that transit. And so what I think you've done is you have offloaded a tremendous amount of emotional baggage that you just can't carry anymore, you know? You just, it's, just, it's just too much. You know, and, there's, and this is a time when all of us, but I'm speaking to you, Cooper, personally, but every single one of us has to drop the baggage yeah. that we really can't carry anymore and to stop grieving for whatever it is that you haven't done. And I, I feel there's also an opening for a way to me, for me to be, to use the talents I have in a different way. I'm a teacher. Yeah. I was a teacher within the school system. Well, you I were very good and ideal. You have Sun, eight, Libra, right on my moon, conjunct Neptune with the moon at 26 Virgo. Of course, you're a great teacher. I mean, you, you really care. And you, you see the, 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 the student body and the individuals. Yes. You see them right away. I mean, when you walk into the room and it's the first day, you look around the room and you can tell who needs who, who needs something, who's going to be trouble. You know, where's the shadow? Oh, oh she's going to be the one. That kind of thing. I mean, your 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 you know skills are are not diminished. I mean, that would be great if you could find an independent way of using them. Yeah, I don't know. My um, progressed moon is going to be transiting my natal ascendant in oh, November. Okay. Well, and that's a rebirth. Yeah, there's a few things happening that I've noticed besides, you know, that have come up when I've been doing my moon rituals and things, that there's a real opening and that there'll be some way I can be of service without losing myself. That, that was always the well you know, it's really people, when people would look at this and say, oh, Mars and Scorpio in the seventh house, gee, you must be really argumentative in relationships. Uh, no, you are very, very controlled, and you really are 
terribly aware of wounding and you don't want to wound others. That's what your Mars is about. And so, you know, um, yeah, I think that what you're talking about is moving closer to the next level. I, I mean, you know, I want to, I really, really encourage everyone to read the article on Neptune on my website because it is about being in between. And, and I love that. It's, yeah. I have to, I'm sorry, I have to admit, it's literary. I love it. It's beautiful. And I went into my, I'm still, I still smoke my, roll my own, went into my smoke shop and I, the woman was giving me a CBD because I might have to have another, a second hip replacement on my left hip. That's my Saturn Pluto going on. And I went in there and I was getting a CBD to take and, um, and we were talking and she was saying, I told her about the article and I, and I explained what it was about. And she said, oh, I've been like that for years. I said, read it. <laughs> I said, there, there is a place in the middle of the sea for you, <laughs> you know. So yes, your transition. I, Carolyn, thank you so much for telling me. Thank this. you, Erin. Such a pleasure, always. It is. I, I, I'm very familiar with you. Thank you. And I do like your hat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for presenting yourself with a lampshade on your head. <laughs> so we have one more uh, question. Okay. We yeah. are going to look at Wanda's chart. So okay. I will grab that in a moment. Oh, and Wanda, right. would you like to go ahead, please? Hi, Erin. Uh, <laughs> Um, um, yeah, um, well, the, the Saturn Pluto conjunction uh, will be I, happening in my fifth house. I can't see anything except yeah, for, it, oh, it, it, okay, it. hang on, wait a sec, let me get, ah, there you are, Wanda, and you've got uh, the Saturn Pluto conjunction is in your fifth house, and it's making, uh, Wow, child. Oh, you were born during that during the revolution. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you're about fifty. Yes, fifty-three. Well done. So what's your question? Uh well, um let's see. I guess a sense it it's a sextile to my um Mercury. Yeah. And yeah. my um no axis and the Neptune conjunct the south node. I guess I'm kind of looking at that. Uh, right now I'm kind of going through a, oh boy, a complete questioning period of everything. <laughs> oh, oh, really? I see. I understand. Um, I know it well. Um, ah, so there it is. We've got um, Pluto in a set style to the trine of, uh, sitting at the midpoint really of Neptune, trine, Saturn, and Mercury. And I think this has to do with something deeply um, reincarnative, if you will. In other words, that you need to give birth to yourself in a new way. And this is, it's very painful. I mean, anybody who's had actually given birth, because it has been trying in your, your Pluto Uranus rising, okay? And, you know, when you're born with Uranus and Pluto rising and the Saturn in opposition to it, the revolution that took place, whether you were actively involved in it or just, uh, you know, thinking other thoughts, um, it's actually coming up now uh, for you because we've got, you know, it's been trying your Pluto Uranus now it's moving to sex cell Saturn. What is it about your relationships that you need to regain a sense of, of giving but not giving away? Um, Pisces and Scorpio together are probably the best servants in the world. And the idea with Pisces is to serve, not suffer. And I think the break of the pattern, because it is sextile, 
of Pluto and Saturn coming together in the fifth house saying, for me, my creativity lies in the area of reorganizing my responsibilities toward other people and being able to accept that I am basically a dreamer. Um, you're a dreamer. You were born under that revolutionary Saturn, Pluto, Uranus. You have Neptune in your third house at 21 degrees of Scorpio, which is, of course, well trying to Saturn and Mercury and Chiron and about the dark moon Lilith in there. So, I mean, it's not, it's not a horrible transit, but it, it, it does make you, maybe make you feel, I should insist that it does, um, that, you're, that you need to do something more creative with yourself, that you really need to find a medium in which your creativity is, is actually visible, that you can see it, to make it real, to make it hard, yeah, hard copy. So do you write or paint or sculpt or anything like that? Uh, not a, a little bit. Um, I, I have been working on um, working on my garden and, and as far as uh, doing the um, container garden, vegetable container gardening. But it seems like every time Saturn Pluto, I keep Saturn going, Pluto. yeah. Sorry. But it's like it seems like every time I get going, something comes up where I'm being asked to put aside what um, I need to do okay. in order and sacrifice myself for and, others. And it's it's real. Like you really do have to do this, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I, I get it. Um, the reason I ask that is because, you know, sometimes we, you know, but, but if it's very real, very necessary, and it would be absolutely against the, all rules of, of love and existence to not do it, then I'm going to have to say that, that that is very much Saturn Pluto, is that you are being forced into service, wherein uh, you are not able to resist, and that you have to do it, and it will end. I mean, not not the people that you're doing it with, but, but the, this feeling and also the resultant experience of the Saturn-Pluto in the fifth house of love given and, and the eleventh house is love received. So it's like children. You have to look after your children. You have to nurture those who are weaker than yourself. And you, are, you, know, you do have to do it. And it is a period of time in which it will... You know, because, well, not because of, because astrology is never because of anything. Um, with the trine, the midpoint, it's sitting at the midpoint of Mercury and Saturn and Neptune. I think that when they finally get out of this uh, exactitude of aspect in 2021, that your year of penance, if you will, or giving, um, and voluntarily, uh, but with responsibility, um, will be over. But the consciousness that comes with it, I think that's where you're examining your sense of obligation toward others, you know, with all that Pisces and the seven. You must feel that you were born, born to do everything for other people. And you actually have Pluto and Uranus rising, which says you were born to be a powerhouse and to, you know, really look very closely in at no side of life yes definitely but it, it, it's in the past it has come at, at the cost of my health and I feel like I'm at a point where I have to make a choice um, and I just I can't go back to doing things in that manner before because I, I say my health always that was the price that well, I pay I can see with the moon and the uh, 12th of being able to pick up the collective unconscious on an emotional level and it being in opposition to the house of the body the 12th house is the, is the psyche and the 6th house is the soma the body so it's psychosomatic and so our bodies and our souls are intermingled and there's no, no sort of clear boundary which is where I think this comes in 
because it is Aquarius. You have Venus in Aquarius. You can split off. You don't have to, to you know, give up your body and soul to others. But yes, I can see where that that your health, and it would usually probably be the feminine organs because it's it's Venus, and the Moon, and this also may be something that has run down through your family line, and that it comes from something much further back. I mean, into childhood and breaking old patterns, archaic patterns of childhood in, you know, the turning point of, of life at 50 ish. Um, in my book on midlife and aging, I'm going to, you know, quite a bit of detail on, on the various things that happen to us at these at the ages of midlife and aging. And um, I think it's going to be very important for you to. Um, you know, start saying no, which is very hard for you to do. I don't know too many Piscean, Virgo, Aquarius types of people that can say no. And Neptune in Scorpio is not a no-sayer. It is a, I'm in there for you. I'm in there to save your life, basically. Thank you. Does that make sense to you then, Nick? Yes, it does. It definitely does. Good. I thought so. I'm glad. Thank you. Okay, Erin. Those readings were, <coughs> excuse me, amazing. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much. That brings us to the end. Well, close to the end. Um, do you want to leave us with any final thoughts on this Saturn Pluto conjunction? Or, um, yes, I think that. You know, I don't want to stress too much being miserable and unhappy and freaked out. Um, however, having said that, uh, it's real. <laughs> so, if, 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 you know, if you're afraid, if one is afraid and you look around and there's not really anything to be afraid of except maybe an argument you had with a friend last week, which you can repair, but, but there's, there's nothing of evident in your immediate surroundings then some of it seeps in through the media and I have become very discouraged with because I don't watch the news but I do get up in the morning I like to look at my iPhone I check you know uh, the Guardian and the BBC and, and and NPR and everything in the last couple of years and it's been very subtle has changed to be it's all about death and destruction and negativity, all of it. And so I've had to go, I am so disappointed because that was something I looked forward to every morning was have my coffee and, you know, read the news on, the, on my iPhone and then get to work. And now it's like I just keep flipping through because there's just too many, you know, for instance, um, I just uh, found out by this morning that uh, – Bin Laden's son has been assassinated. And I went, whoa, this is going to cause a big problem. Because you know, basically all hell will break loose. When I was traveling through uh, Yemen, we passed the Bin Laden palace, and it was absolutely stunning. But, you know, things um, are happening on a daily basis now, and so I think we need to to really, rather than look out as, at, at seeing how horrible things are, is to look within ourselves. I, I'm, I'm trying this myself, I promise you. I'm not just moving on. Of how do I find my own boundary, Saturn, so that I can contain the wealth that Pluto guards in my soul as an Earth person? Because Hades, as I mentioned, drew the short straw. That's why he ended up as the guardian of all of Gaia's wealth. And we're in an environmental crisis as well. So I try to find a place within myself where I can put, you know, some boundary of con consciousness, of awareness, not trying to pretend it's not there, but to say, okay, that is happening. Many people are suffering. Some of them just down the road from me in, in New Mexico, literally. And I, I can't take, I am not God. 
You know, I'm not God or a goddess. I am a human being. So I can't actually make that kind of difference, but I can make a difference in myself, which would rub off on my friends and my children, because I have grown children, 50, 49, grandchildren, 22, um, three grandchildren in that age bracket. And, you know, um, my own anxiety is easily transferred onto them. They have let me know. They have let me know that, that, you know, that there is a limit to what they can have and what I need. And it was a very wise discussion that I had with my kids the other night about the situation that was going on. And I said, well, you know, we all feel it. And, but we don't have to all extroject it, you know, like project it out onto others or say it must be the mailman because my mailbox fell apart, things like that. So, I mean, it seems very simplistic, doesn't it? But it basically is all we can really do when it comes to uh, global affairs. Uh, and it doesn't bode well. Now, there's no point being silly. But it also means that we have to really use Saturn as a, as a personal boundary to contain our own wealth. That's basically what I think we can in part do. That's wonderful. Thank you for that advice. And if I can quote you, you said we need to draw on extraordinary strength and not fall victim to the global psychosis. So I love that. Thank and you. I'd like to thank you so much for doing this Zoom meeting with us. And we're looking forward to seeing you again in the future. And thank you. would you all please thank Erin Sullivan, everyone. Thank you, Erin. That was just wonderful, as always. Oh, thanks so much. I, I, you know, <laughs> I love you all. I love, I love you. Oh, we love you too, Erin. Thank you so much. Okay. I second what Carolyn said. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much.